And the next situation I want you to do on the acetate sheets you have. And what it's going to be is this. I want you to tell me how many different ways you can think of for dividing a square into four equal pieces. The pieces have to be the same in size, shape, and area. Many ways is possible for dividing a square into four pieces, four equal pieces, as many different ways as possible. Okay, let's go through those ways of dividing the square up. Some of the fairly obvious ones are where we just draw that, or we just draw that, or we just draw down the middle and draw that. You could also have one way divided into two halves, and then you divide the halves into two halves again, and you can do that in a number of ways. You might divide them into two L pieces, many, many varieties of doing that. Then there's another one in which you would divide this into little squares, for example, here I'm dividing it into 16 little squares, and then I can take different arrangements of the little squares. I might take that arrangement, which is the sort of L-shape arrangement, and so on, and there are other arrangements. Those are some of the more obvious ones. Now, let's see if there's any other ones which anyone has. Any volunteers? Anyone? Okay, let's collect some of those up. I'll put them up fairly quickly. All right, let's have those three for the moment. They've got to be equal pieces, remember? Equal in size, shape, and area. Okay, that's, that's a good one. We'll come to that in a moment. It's a pretty general principle in that one. This one, uh, there are four pieces, but... Oh, yes, that's all right. Fair enough. That's interesting. Yes, they're equal. Okay. Uh, some of these, they're not equal in uh, area. Okay, there's some general principles there. And, in fact, there's an infinite number of ways of doing it. One way of getting the infinite number, which was suggested in some of these, but as a general principle, is we draw our square, and imagine we draw the diagonal on a little disk, like that, and then we can rotate that as slowly as we like, and each point we stop, obviously, is another position. And as we can rotate it infinitely slowly, there's an infinite number of ways. Another way of getting the infinite number which again was suggested in one of the ones you gave me, is if you take the center point and you take a position, any position along the side and the same position along any side and you draw a line of any shape towards the center and repeat that line all the way around, this can be any shape, then you get an infinite number of ways of dividing it like that. And then there's another one which is somewhat similar, really it's part of that, where imagine we draw the diagonals and then you change the shape of one of these. Suppose we change that and we change the shape of each one the same way. And you get an infinite number as well. Now the point I want to make with that is that sometimes in a situation we think there are these alternatives and then there cannot be any more. We've exhausted all the alternatives. And that's the time we really need to put a little effort into going further saying what are the alternatives. And indeed in business in general what usually happens, which is a pity, is that people put a little effort into getting alternatives and then they put all their effort into deciding between them and business schools and others put all the emphasis on decision between alternatives and yet in practice it's often just as useful, I won't say more useful, just as useful to put a lot more time uh, turning up additional alternatives for decision and action there rather than just feeling that business decisions are only in the decision area. Now, let me move on to another very important point about alternatives. And there's a true story which happened to me uh, about um, six months ago. And I was in uh, Los Angeles, and I was catching a plane to Toronto, and I had to wake up at half past four in the morning, 4.30 in the morning. So I set my alarm clock, and there was one of these rather nice, elaborate bedside alarm clocks, which I um, set at the right time and so on. And 4.30 came, and this alarm clock gave off a very loud... Um, noise, racket, buzz. So I woke up, and in order not to wake up all the neighbors, I 
turn and uh, press the button to switch it off. Nothing happened. I then pressed the button to change from noise to radio. Nothing happened. I then pressed the alarm set button. Nothing happened. I then pulled the plug out of the wall. Nothing happened. It still went on making a racket. That's not so surprising, because sometimes they have batteries in in cases of power cut. I then put a pillow over the whole thing, and nothing happened, still making a loud racket. I now had two choices, either to ring up reception and say very feebly, how do I turn my alarm clock off, which is very feeble, or to put the whole thing in a bucket of water and hope that stopped it. It was only then that I realized that the noise was not being made by this clock, it was being made by my other little alarm clock, which I'd set and totally forgotten about. <laughs> now, the point of the exercise was, the point of my saying it, is that at no point did I even stop to consider whether there was an alternative source of the noise. It never occurred to me that that was a situation for looking for alternatives. <coughs> and this leads to a very important point about our search for alternatives, that where we're asked to, as I have been asking you, that's not too difficult. But where we're absolutely convinced that this is the only way, the only explanation, we don't really make an effort to look. And indeed, there's something which I call the village Venus effect. And the village Venus effect is that if you live in a small village, then the prettiest girl in the village, that's supposed to be a pretty girl, and even though it doesn't look very like it, uh, the prettiest girl in the village <coughs> is necessarily the prettiest girl in the world because you can't imagine anyone else. Similarly, in science and other areas, if we have a theory, and we cannot imagine any other theory, we are convinced that it is right. And indeed, this is something which in one of my books I wrote up, what I call de Bono's second law, which is that proof is often no more than lack of imagination. Lack of imagination and thinking of an alternative, we are convinced that this is the explanation, this is the proof. And indeed, to some extent, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution is still based on that. It is simply our lack of imagination of thinking of a better theory, which is the, really the only proof for it. There are now various other theories, even theories of non-genetic evolution, how the chemistry of the mother affects the chemistry of the child, affects the chemistry of the child, and so on. But that's a whole other area. Now, let's move on from that, and let's move towards something practical. And the practical thing I want to talk about is what I call an APC. That sounds like jargon, but it's really just a set of initials which allows us to talk about something. APC stands for alternatives possibilities, choices. All the things we've been looking at in this exercise. And there are two ways of doing it. We can either look for the alternative explanations of why something has happened, or we can look for alternative courses of action that we may have to choose in order to do something. And to save time, I'm going to give you both those at once. So one half of the room will look for alternative uh, explanations of the situation I'm going to tell you and the other half of the room is going to look for alternative courses of action and the situation is this I want you to listen very carefully because it would take too long to write what it is this you're in your car at a petrol station and someone drives up in a car belonging to a friend of yours you recognize the car and the person who gets out is not friend of yours, it's someone else, and this person proceeds to do something very strange. He proceeds to pour what appear to be cans of beer into the petrol tank. So there's this strange person in your friend's car pouring what appear to be cans of beer into the petrol tank. Now, this half of the room, I want you to tell me alternative possible explanations. This half of the room, I want you to tell me alternative courses of action that you could do. All right, so work in your groups, the groups we formed beforehand. Alternative explanations, alternative course of action.